Initially, when I planned this video, I really wanted to make our house look beautiful and aspirational. You know, you see it all over YouTube, these beautiful house tours, but this flat is a hell. I mean, look, look, behind this star of distraction here is this horribly ugly electric fireplace from what, the 70s, the 80s? Anyway, that's not what this video is about. This video is about hashtag furniture free. <coughs> hashtag furniture free. And how we eat, sleep and work on the floor and we don't have most of the conventional furniture that people in the Western world have. So let's start with why. Why would you want to go furniture free? What benefit is there for you? Well, the simple answer is it provides more opportunities for movement. And movement opportunities are something that's going to come up loads in this video, but to keep it simple, movement opportunities are just how many times throughout the day you get a chance to move, as opposed to just staying in the same position for extended periods of time. Furniture provides almost the opposite of movement opportunities. It provides sedentary opportunities. It provides you the opportunity to sit completely still for hours and hours at a time. So I don't want to talk too much about sedentary lifestyles because I'm going to be making a whole video about it in the future. But a sedentary lifestyle is a lifestyle involving little or no physical activity throughout the day. So for instance, somebody that gets up, drives to work, sits at their desk for eight or 10 hours a day, drives back home, and then sits watching TV or on their computer for the rest of the day will be living a very sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyles and their associated problems like diabetes and obesity are quickly becoming one of the most common causes of preventable death in the world. So like I said, I don't want to talk for too long about sedentary lifestyles, so I've put some links to some good articles in the description, so if you need more information then go have a read. Oh and one more thing, go and do your own research, because you can't always trust that random people on the internet making YouTube videos know what they're talking about. Now, I think I know what I'm talking about, but I might not, or I might be lying, you don't know. So go and do your own research, it's worth it, and you'll get a lot more knowledge that way anyway. So let's talk about chairs. Now there's a bit of a misconception about chairs, and that is that there is something inherently wrong with the position that you sit in in a chair, which isn't really true. The reality is that there's nothing wrong with the actual sitting position. What's wrong is the fact that you're sitting there for so long. If you sit in any position, or if you stay in any position for an extended period of time, whether that's standing, whether that's balancing on one leg, doing a headstand, or a plank, or anything, it won't be good for you. Think of it like this. Say you break your arm, it gets put in a cast, and strapped to your shoulder, and you have to keep it there for four, six, eight weeks, depending on how bad it is. What happens when it gets taken out of the cast? Well over that, say, six week period, the muscles in your arm atrophy and the tendons get tighter and shorter and the joints become stiff. And when you get your arm out of the cast, it's really hard to move your arm. It doesn't feel right, nothing's working, and it takes quite a long time for that arm to recover. Now, there's nothing wrong with this position, but if I leave my arm there for eight weeks, things will start to go stiff, muscle will atrophy, and that will cause problems. That's essentially the problem we've got with chairs. The thing is, even though chairs themselves aren't a problem, they do still cause a lot of problems. And the real problem is that we just spend so much time in them. We spend so long every single day in that same position, in the chair position. The lack of movement starts to cause our muscles and our tendons to become shorter and for our joints to get weaker, and for our bones to become less dense. Yes, sitting in a chair isn't a problem in itself, but being there for months and months and months on end, years on end, in that position every single day will start to cause problems. But then, if they're so bad for us, why do we even use chairs? I mean, there are other cultures around the world that don't use chairs. For instance, India, where, well, people sit on the floor almost every day of their lives. And it's the same in Japan. They seem to use chairs for office work and in school, but when they go home, they often eat on the floor. And the thing is, that's the same for loads of cultures. There's people all over the world eating, sitting, doing things on the floor every single day. So how come we don't? 
why do we sit in chairs all the time in the UK and in America and in a lot of Europe? Why do we do that? Well, the thing is, it's kind of for a stupid reason. Throughout history, poor people like to come across as though they are wealthier than they are. And it's sad, but it's very much true. For instance, when people used to live outside and work outside every day of their lives, it was a sign of wealth to be pale. It proved that you lived indoors and didn't have to go work in the fields. So people that couldn't afford to not work outside used to rub powdered lead on their face to make themselves more pale. And in a sense, that powdered lead is a little bit like sitting. We now know that that's not a particularly good idea, but people did it for a long time. And with the case of sitting, we're still doing it now, even though we can see the health deficit deficits. And the thing is, there are loads more examples of this throughout history. When the poor couldn't afford to eat, so the poor became skinny, it was a sign of being rich when you were a bit plumper, when you were a bit fat. So that became popular. People tried to become fat because it showed that you had money. When food became commonplace and poor people started to become fat, the rich decided they want to be skinny again. And then people keep following the trends. And that's where we get to chairs. Initially, Chairs were only for rich people. In fact, they weren't even for rich people. They were for rulers, for kings and barons and lords. To sit on a chair or a throne was to sit above people. It was to prove your status. You were more important than them, so you sat higher up than them. So obviously, as the trend goes, people that didn't have as much money started making their own chairs or their own stools, ways to raise themselves up, to convey the idea that they're more wealthy than they are. And this went on and on and on, and more and more people tried to look like they had money, so they made more chairs. And in the end, it got to the point where you would be seen as poor if you didn't have a chair, so more and more and more chairs. And then we're here now where it's weird if you don't have a chair. I mean, people think I'm weird all the time when I say I don't have furniture in my house. <laughs> And this idea that people are poor if they don't have chairs still goes on today. And I don't mean in other countries. I mean, people in the UK and in the USA look at poor countries and think, oh, they're sitting on the floor, they must be poor. But it's not always the case. It's just not true. It's just a preconceived notion that there is something worse about sitting on the floor. Like, oh, they can't afford chairs. The question is, why do you need furniture? And in my opinion, the answer is you don't. Furniture takes up space and it costs us money. And in the end, it also uses up resources. Let me read you a quick passage from the book Primate Change by Vibar Cragen Reed. I really hope I pronounced his name right. Do a quick count of the chairs in your house. At a glance, mine has four in the living room, another five in the kitchen and one in the study, 10 chairs. No wait, in the garden, there are two more chairs and a couple of two seater benches too. That's 16. Should I add the chairs on my car? That's another four. Gathering up a couple of old fold-up chairs for emergencies brings a total to 22. There are only two of us. So think about it. If two people own 22 chairs between them, and there are seven billion people on Earth, how is that sustainable? That's... So carrying on from where I left off, 11 chairs each. 22 chairs between two people. That's quite a lot. And that adds up really, really quickly. I mean, if there are seven people, seven people on Earth, there aren't seven people on Earth. There might be actually, who knows. If every person on Earth had 11 chairs, there would be 77 billion chairs. Billions and billions and billions and billions. But that's not even the start of it, because there's more chairs than just what one person owns. There's chairs in a bus, or on a train, or in the waiting room at your doctor's office, or think about all of the chairs at your workplace. There's probably hundreds there. Most of them probably not in use most of the time. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. And then there's hotels and convention centers and stadiums. Literally just down the road from me, there's the Etihad Stadium, which is Manchester City Football Club's own stadium. In there, there's 55,000 seats that are empty most of the time. 
On the other side of Manchester, there's Manchester United Stadium, which has 76,000 empty seats. So between just two stadiums in one city, there's 130,000 empty seats. Imagine if all those places didn't have any seats and they were just big open spaces. How many tons of wood and plastic and metal and leather and fabric would be saved if we didn't need all those chairs? And I know that's not realistic. It's not gonna happen anytime soon. Most workplaces aren't just gonna chuck out all their furniture. But just because workplaces won't get rid of all of their chairs doesn't mean you have to waste your money and your quite possibly limited household space on pointless furniture. So on that note, now it's time to talk about our house. So we've been furniture free for about four years now. So I'm gonna show you around our house, show you what we've done and talk a bit about how you can go furniture free and how you can get more movement in in your everyday life in your house without really putting any more effort in. And that's the really great thing about going furniture free is that once you've gone past the initial hurdle of transitioning to being furniture free and physically taking your furniture out, you get all this extra movement in your life without trying to. So I think this is a good time to show you one of my party tricks. Now, for reference, I don't train the splits and I haven't really ever trained to do the splits. I've just been furniture free for four years and you know, I can't quite get all the way down, but I think considering I don't do it, I don't think this is too bad at all. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna promise that this will get you the splits going furniture free, but you know, it can get you pretty close. Okay, back to sitting under the tree again. There's one more thing that I want to talk about before I just show you around our house. And that's about transitioning to living furniture free. Transitioning to go furniture free isn't difficult in the same way that say, training for a marathon is difficult. You don't have to actively do loads of things. You don't have to go out for a run. You don't have to try really hard. But what going furniture free does take is time. And for that reason, I really don't recommend that you just chuck out all of your furniture. If you just chuck out all of your furniture in one go and try to not think about it, you'll probably just experience injuries and pain. Our bodies take time to adapt, not forever. In fact, humans are very, very good at adapting, but you can't go from living your whole life in chairs and on sofas to just immediately being on the floor. So, I would recommend that you start by trying to spend time on the floor without chairs, without sofas, for a while before you decide to actually get rid of things. Especially as that gives you an opportunity to see if you even like it. The thing is, however much I think it's really good for you, and I think that most people should go furniture free, I'll be honest, a lot of people probably won't enjoy it. They'll try it and they'll absolutely hate it and then they'll wish they never got rid of their furniture. Yeah, like I said, that's just one thing to think about. It takes time to go furniture free. So if you're really struggling at the moment, just be persistent. Try and spend a little bit of time on the floor every day and try and build that time up longer and longer. And when you can spend hours on the floor without feeling any pain or discomfort, that's when it's time to get rid of your furniture. Not, ooh, I'm really interested in furniture free. Chuck everything out. Because in reality, that just won't go well for you. So like I said, now I'm gonna show you around our house and show you all the ways that we've gone furniture free and just how we use the space in our everyday lives. So I'm gonna start up here. This is Francis's workstation. And yeah, it's a table and I cut the legs off of it. And that's it really, it's just a low table. But that's only half of Francis's workstation. The other half is right here, just the floor. Often she just lays down the floor on her laptop or drawing or writing or doing whatever she needs to do. Now, you might be thinking, But Billy, isn't that some furniture? That table? And yeah, you're right. It is some furniture. And I have a desk as well. Uh, but there are a couple of reasons why we have them. So 
The first one is that it's really nice to have a few different heights to work on. So it's nice to have a, a higher surface to work on so you can kneel or sit cross-legged and then a floor area so you can lay down or work on your side or sit with it on your lap or however you want to work. The other reason is that laptops and computers really aren't designed to be used laying on your front on them or hunched over on the floor. It's a lot easier to use them with your arms here because they were designed with chairs in mind and often you'd be sitting, typing and doing whatever you're doing around this height. The other thing she has is this IKEA puff, whatever you want to call it, thing, wicker, I don't know, this thing. And this is so, again, the idea of multiple heights. So she can sit kneeling here, but sitting cross-legged, it's just a little bit low, keeps your arms up here, which is fine for a while, but eventually it's nice to have a little bit of extra height. Again, options. More options equal more movement. And there are endless sitting positions you could pick here, so I'm not going to go through and show you all of them, but between the different heights of the table and the floor and this to add a little bit of extra height to where you're sitting, you can, you've got a lot of choices. Okay, so now I'm going to go show you my workstation. And this is my workstation. Now, as you can probably tell, I'm not that tidy. <laughs> this is my slightly messy workstation. Uh, it's a desktop instead of a laptop, but other than that, it's almost exactly the same as Francis's. So, I've got a desk, it's only this high off the floor, about that, about that far, and I have the floor to use which is just here and I have this which is just it's a an air pillow thing that you put on office chairs to give you more movement throughout the day but I use it in the same way that Frances uses her wicker uh, puff thing to give me a little bit extra height when I want to sit up on my bum to use my computer and then when I want to kneel or do other positions I move it out of the way. Um, but obviously the most important thing about this workstation is my gaming PC and my PlayStation 3, my PlayStation 2 and my PlayStation 1. And that's it. Oh, and my plants. I've got plants. I like my plants. The only other thing you could really consider a workstation in my office room is this, my keyboard. I'd love to play something really beautiful on the keyboard right now, but I'm at a, such an early stage of learning at the moment that the best I've got is Twinkle, twinkle, little star. So here we go. And I messed it up. This is our dining room table. And by dining room table, I mean tablecloth on the floor. Now I'll be honest, it takes quite a long time to get used to sitting on the floor. So initially, when we first started going furniture free, we were still eating our food on the table, Francis's workstation table to be exact. But fairly recently, we bought this table mat and we literally haven't eaten a meal off the table since. We've eaten all our meals off of the floor. Now I'm not gonna to talk to you too much about how to eat while being furniture free off of the floor on this table mat because it's much easier to just show you. I made a video a few months ago showing me and Francis eating dinner one night and I've got a little counter on the screen showing how many times each of us moved. Hopefully you can see that up on the screen right now if future Billy manages to edit it in. And by manages I mean remembers. And if you're interested in watching the whole video there'll be a link in the description and a link in the card in the corner, whichever corner that is. One of the things I really recommend, in fact whether you're going furniture free or not, is a big open space. An open space where you can walk around, jump around, spin around, dance around, do whatever you want to do without crashing into anything. Now, you can do that without getting rid of all your furniture, but it is a bit easier if you get rid of all your furniture because there's just loads more space when you've not got tables, when you've not got chairs in the way. Space is great because it lets you do things that you often can't do in most people's houses because there's just too many things in the way, like handstands. And these definitely aren't natural movements, but I've been training these because I have room for it. Before, I never used to have room to do handstands, so I just didn't. 
And it's not just handstands, you can do anything. You can do rolls, you can crawl, you can jump. Okay, you can't do anything, but you know what I mean. There's options when you have space. Keep coming back to it, options, movement opportunities, ways that you can do more movement without really adding too much to your life. If you have to clear a space every time you want to do anything, what's the likelihood you're going to do that thing? If you're just walking through the space and think, oh, I want to do a handstand and there's room for it, you can do a handstand, you can do a roll, you can jump, you can, I don't know, dance, you can do whatever you want to do. But I'll be honest, after a while of having a big open space, it started to get a little bit boring because while you do have more movement opportunities, more options, you're still kind of stuck with just having a flat area of floor. So that's when I built these. I've got a pair of them. These are scaffold pole beams. And one hangs around in the hallway. So every time we go through the hallway, we have to walk on it. And one, whoop, and I'm doing really rubbish. And one hangs around in the living room so we can always balance on it. Apparently it's really hard to talk to the camera while balancing on a beam. Boop, boop. One of the other ways that we encourage more movement in our open space area is by having this. This is a fingerboard. It's normally used for climbing training, but you don't have to have a fingerboard. You can just have a pull-up bar. I really recommend having something to hang on in your house because hanging something that is really, really important to us as humans, but most people don't ever do. So yeah, this is just a thing that you can hang on, swing around on, and it's in our doorway. So every time you walk through, you have the chance to swing on it if you want to. And alongside the big open space and the balancing beams and the fingerboards and the pull-up bars, I've also got a few of these, just wooden blocks that I've just cut up a big bit of wood and there they are. And when you combine them all, it suddenly creates a lot more opportunities for movement in the space. So you kind of end up with almost an obstacle course and I'll, I'll show you what I mean now. And even after all that movement to get from my office to the kitchen, there's even more movement once you get here. And that's because of this. This is a cobblestone tray and it's a tray full of stones. And what it does is it provides you a balancing challenge while you're standing on it, as well as getting your foot more used to being barefoot by pushing on it in different angles and having some spiky stones and having some smoother stones. So in the mornings I can stand here and grind my coffee or cut vegetables or well, whatever you want to do in the kitchen, cook or washing up, you can move around the kitchen. Now I'm not gonna talk about it too much because I've made a whole video about the stone tray. So it's gonna be a link in that corner. Please be that corner, might not be that corner and one in the description. So if you're interested in that, go watch it there. Ever since we went furniture free about four years ago, I've been doing poos like this. Now, this might look a bit weird, but squatting is the natural position to do a number two in. And I know people often don't like to talk about this kind of thing, but the reality is sitting on a toilet is not the best way to go to the toilet. But this position isn't really that great because as you might be able to see, my toes aren't really on, I'm a bit cramped, it's not very comfortable. And to tell the truth, I have no idea how strong this toilet bowl is. It's fine when I'm sitting on it, but am I really meant to be squatting on it? So what I decided to do was look up other solutions. So I looked it up and obviously in other countries where they have much less of a chair culture, they have these things called squat toilets. One will be up on the screen right now. But this is a rented flat. I can't install a squat toilet into my rented flat for obvious reasons. So I decided to go about it another way. I decided to build a platform for my toilet 
which would make it like a squat toilet. And it went something like this. you finished watching that bit of the video yet um yeah so yeah so yeah i'm really happy with this platform this this is great this is perfect it's got plenty of room for my feet and i'm not worried about breaking the bowl anymore it's really comfortable i can spend quite a long time here as you can see reading reading katie bowman's book and yeah i'm really happy with it now can you leave so i can carry on going to the toilet please. Cheers. Thank you. So this is our furniture free bedroom and I really wanted to get a good shot of this room but I can't because it's absolutely tiny. But anyway hopefully you can still get the gist. This is our bed and as you can see it's straight down on the floor. It doesn't really have that much of an effect sleeping on the floor as opposed to on a bed frame apart from the fact that the bed frame gives a little bit more spring to the bed and if you have it on the floor, when you get up in the morning, you actually have to actively climb up out of bed instead of just flopping out in the morning. The other thing that's slightly different about our bed is the mattress. This mattress is a futon mattress as opposed to a normal sprung or memory foam mattress. Unlike sprung and memory foam mattresses, which try to sell you on comfort and just, just how soft and comfortable they are, this isn't trying to sell you on that. And the thing is, I find this incredibly comfortable. I find memory foam and sprung mattresses just much too soft and really, really horrible to sleep on now after years of sleep on this mattress. Human bodies aren't meant to be in comfort constantly. That's one of the things about furniture free is that it forces you into lots of different positions and it forces you to not always be just completely lulled into comfort. And that's the same with this mattress. I find it very comfortable to sleep on now. And that's why, if I'm honest, we're not actually that happy with this mattress at the moment because we feel like it's too soft and too comfortable for us. And we want to try to promote a bit more movement by having something a bit thinner. So what we want to replace it with eventually are one of those roll out futon mattresses that you see in Japan. Hopefully there's a picture of one or a video of one on screen at the moment. But yeah, that's what we want to do. And that's that. Now you've seen everywhere in our furniture-free rented flat.
I really, really hope you enjoyed the video, but I'm trying to end this video really quickly because the battery is about to run out any second now. And yeah, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment if you have any questions about furniture free living or natural movement. And thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>